we now have coming up Paul Zach, founding director of the Centre for Neuroeconomic Studies and Professor of Economics at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, Paul, I think, has a book coming out. He's also responsible for the earliest first, first published use of the term neuroeconomics. So you're responsible. It's all my fault. I take yes. responsibility. Paul Zach. Up here. Thank you very much, Roger, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as Roger said, I'm writing a book now called The Moral Molecule, and I'll debut some new material here for the first time. So I hope you uh, will enjoy it. Look forward to your questions. Okay, so very much following from the work that uh, Patricia Churchland mentioned yesterday, Mark Iacoboni and others, um, I'm really interested in this notion of why people are good or bad. So you know, my lab takes on sort of small questions people haven't really thought about. Why are people good and bad? Um, we're going to do this using money. So the, the, the uh, underlying theme here of money in your brain is my claim is that we actually can follow the money to find out whether people are good or bad. And there are lots of reasons that great thinkers through life have given for people being good. Uh, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But within all these reasons, we kind of lack, as Brian said, this underlying theory of why people are doing what they're doing. So the idea is um, these may all matter, but underlying them should be some measurable and potentially manipulable basis for understanding why people are doing one thing, helping out a stranger, versus another thing, uh, stealing money from a stranger. Okay, so that's the work we've been doing for the last five years or so, and uh, I want to tell you a little about that within some structure. So because I'm now crossing into 14 different fields I don't know anything about, um, I want to draw guidance from the greatest thinkers of our age and have a short clip to uh, motivate that if you will run that clip. This benefit concert is going to be scooby dooby. I'm very happy for you, Bart. <gasps> Why are you sad? Thinking about your marriage? If we can't find a home for those animals, they'll be put to sleep. Your sister's very upset. Oh, I feel weird. It's like a potato chip full of shame going down my throat sideways. Honey, what you're feeling is called empathy. Oh, now I'm going to learn a new word. Empathy means you're looking at Lisa and feeling what she feels. Your sister poured her heart into rescuing those animals to forget the pain of being upstaged in jazz. And now... Oh. oh! Oh! How can I end this torture? You could do something nice for Lisa. No! You're my mother. How can you say that? No! That's pretty much my whole talk. Um, what I liked about that... <laughs> Video. By the way, I saw this uh, when I was in Australia a couple of weeks ago, and I immediately, this is why I have graduate students, you know, call my graduate students, like, you have to find the Simpsons episode and cut this out for me, and somehow they did that. You know, Bart's really writhing in pain, his little leg is moving, right, it's really painful to think that you did something that's really going to hurt another person. So, as several other speakers said, this suggests that empathy, this, this emotional connection to someone else, is one reason that we behave morally. And there are, I think, good reasons for this. For group living animals, for a really hyper social species, species like us, having these innate moral values, having this kind of internal mechanism that tells us right from wrong, is a way to sustain complex social relationships. So if we didn't have that, I claim, we couldn't live in civilization. Or the hallmark of civilization is individuals who are unrelated to each other living and working together. So there must be something in our head that says, Adam, very nice guy, seems wonderful, happy to be around him. Marco, as we know, a very sketchy guy, I want to stay away from him, I'm not sure why. Right? So unless we have that, then we actually can't live around these strangers. In fact, human beings are almost unique in that we enjoy living around strangers. Right? Many of us live in these large cities. We're interacting with strangers all the time. How do we do that? Right? How do we do that and not uh, you know, get knifed every day? Again, violence certainly happens, but actually it's a very small part of the kind of uh, interactions we have uh, with other humans. And as Franz Duval in the last five years or so has made a very strong case that both in humans and in non-human primates, particularly apes, that this behavior is driven by empathy. And he calls this sort of thin veneer theory, this idea that underlying our, uh, what we see in the world, that most people get along with each other, is this sort of thin veneer over our true selfish, rapacious selves. He says that's nonsense for group living animals. You would not evolve to be a social species if you had to uh, 
uh, counteract violence 99% of your day. It's very inefficient. So somehow, humans have evolved this ability to get around and to discriminate the atoms from the Marcos. Marcos a wonderful person. So he's a fine person. You can talk to him afterwards. But somehow we have this in our heads in which we very quickly and often unconsciously have sort of a gestalt sense. Oh, hmm, I don't know. Something kind of odd about this person. Uh, I don't have a good feeling about that. And uh, these other people, great. Adam, wonderful guy. Uh, seems fine to me. Okay, so um, uh, my claim is that empathy is one of these underlying mechanisms. It's not the only mechanism, but I think it's an important primary mechanism. And I do refer to a couple other, uh, I think, really wonderful summary books, a lot of this literature, uh, Duvall's book, Ridley's book, and uh, Michael Shermer's book, uh, Science of Good and Evil. Okay, so how do we get a handle on this? Um, as you guys know, many of you know, uh, my lab uh, in 2004 discovered that oxytocin affects human behaviors, particularly the decision whether you should trust somebody or not. Um, oxytocin is derived from an ancient hormone that first appeared in fish about 100 million years ago and evolved in mammals to facilitate care for offspring, which really is the hallmark of mammals. In about 5% of mammals that are monogamous, at least socially monogamous, um, oxytocin all facilitates parental care and long-term bonds between males and females. Um, so my claim is that oxytocin in humans is this physiologic signature for empathy. It's a way that we can both measure and manipulate empathy levels and therefore should reveal something about um, moral behaviors. So I'm going to try to uh, support that claim in the, la in the next uh, six or seven minutes. And we're going to do that by having an underlying structure we call Thomas. Thomas is the human oxytocin mediated attachment system. And this system has two primary uh, kind of hallmarks, um, hungry and fuzzy. So it's a hungry system because it's looking for targets, right? It's, uh, as Patricia mentioned yesterday, this is a system that modulates midbrain dopamine release and it feels good when we get to attach to something. So think of oxytocin as this sort of attachment uh, mechanism as we care about my offspring, my spouse, uh, my friends, and even complete strangers under some circumstances. It's also a fuzzy system in which it's not very good at targeting. Okay, I want to give you some examples of both hungry and fuzzy. So think of this system as in our heads, uh, moving around, looking for targets. Uh, doesn't have to be very discriminating. Because it's an ancient molecule, it's in evolutionarily old areas of the human brain, so it's below our level of conscious awareness. It's just this motivator or this sense of, I ought to do this, I ought not to do that. Okay, so let me try to, try to give you some examples of Thomas. One is actually in uh, non-humans, uh, dogs and cats. This actually came out of my local paper, the Press Enterprise, about a month ago, in which you had a uh, miniature Doberman pincher that was high in oxytocin. She's nursing her pups. She's given birth. And into her house wanders, or into her yard wanders, four stray kittens. And she begins to nurse those kittens. Cats and dogs, dogs predate on cats, right? A dog should not be spending metabolic resources taking care of cats. Okay, and yet it does. Why? Because the system now is in high gear. It's looking for targets. It's hungry for targets. Okay, how about a human example? Okay. You know, I, I've done these surveys in which I ask people in, in lectures, you know, who would spend $10,000 to save their dog's life? Okay, you guys, 10000 How about five? Okay, a thousand bucks. I mean, okay, we bred dogs to be our companions, right? To help us, to um, guard us. And yet, we have people who are dressing up their animals, these things we created like human beings, and spending lots of money. <laughs> Might be Britney Spears, I'm not sure. Let's not go there. So, uh, this is really interesting behavior that now we're, we have strong attachments to a different species. So much so that we treat them like children. Right? That's a very fuzzy system. Okay. How about these guys? Why do we adopt children? Say, so, well, this sort of standard view in biology, Hamilton's rule says I should care about people to the extent I share their genes. And yet you have these uh, people who have an enormous amount of resources. They could easily adopt babies that are more ethnically similar to them, but actually they choose volitionally to, ch to adopt children that look much different than them, right? This is a very hungry and fuzzy system. Any target will do, okay? And they can produce their own children. 
They don't need to adopt, yet they do anyway. So I think it's a beautiful thing. I'm not actually putting it out. I think it's wonderful. And everyone's actually familiar, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this uh, slide from Heider and Simmel, in which if you ask uh, most adults, most healthy adults, to describe, I won't play the, the movie for you, but it's a movie in which the large triangle is chasing the small triangle and the, and the circle. Yes, people describe this and they anthropomorphize this movie. Well, the big triangle's mean, and he's attacking them, and the small one's scared. Why do we do that? These are just shapes. So little children, uh, many people with autism, would just give you a factual depiction of that. There's two triangles, one's big, one's small, there's a circle, they're moving around, they're going into the box, going outside the box, yet we are sort of compelled to make this not only a uh, kind of human drama, but an emotionally compelling human drama, right? We're looking for that story, that emotion underlying the behavior because they have agency, basically. So things with agency we impute motive to. Okay, so what we want to do now is take these insights and see if we can elicit Thomas in the laboratory. So my claim is that we can use this using money. Uh, within this neuroeconomics paradigm, money is uh, an index of how much you care about something. So I want to tempt you with virtue and vice by putting money on the table. And when I do this, I want to see if I can understand how Thomas works in real life, quote, real life settings in which cash is on the table. And these, again, are hungry college students who need cash. Right? So if they're helping other people, then uh, I think we have some insights into something they really care about. So uh, as Roger mentioned, the first work we did in 2004, 2005, we had people do a task which involved monetary transfers. You can take money out of your pocket. You can ship that to someone else in the lab that you can't see or can't talk to. Uh, if you do that, this money will triple in size, but the other person controls it. And then the other person can send some amount back to you or can keep the whole thing. So the standard view from economics and most social sciences is that people are self-interested. You send me money, great, I like money. I'm a poor college student. Oh, and by the way, the amount of monies are moderate. We're going to stick your arm with a needle and take four tubes of blood out. So you're literally making decisions based on blood money. Kids take this seriously. And what happens in this task is that people readily send money to another person. And the more money they send, the more that person's brain releases oxytocin. And in turn, the more oxytocin you have on board, the more you reciprocate. So everything works in uh, a nice circle in which somehow our brains have realized that uh, we have this model of human nature, which is we are reciprocal creatures. So we're not homo, homo economicus, we're really homo reciprocons. For most of us, for 98% of us, when someone reaches out to us, we respond. Okay? And this is a mechanism through which we respond, and the compensating factor for giving up this money uh, likely is midbrain dopamine release. So it feels good. It feels good to be good. Right? Isn't that interesting? Right? So now we're understanding these pathways um, using empathy, using the mirror neuron system, and oxytocin through which I sense why this person sent me the money. Oh, I get it. They took money out of their pocket. They sent it to me. They're not doing that to be nice to me. They're doing it because the pie grows. But there's a sort of implicit expectation. Uh, in, we run many at UCLA. So in the UCLA vernacular, hey, dude, I hope you get it. Right? I sent you all this money so that you can share some back with We both can be made better off. Okay, that's great. So again, relative to people who just received a random monetary transfer, unintentional transfer, oxytocin levels are about 50% higher. Now, it is possible that we're sloppy scientists. We mismeasured oxytocin. It's a very slippery hormone to measure. It degrades rapidly room temperature. The handling protocols are very, very uh, uh, important. So we, uh, to show causation, infuse this into human brains using a really big drill. We drill into people's heads. And we screw, no, we don't do that. We use a nasal spray. So we spray this into people's noses, give it about an hour to diffuse into the brain. There are pharmacologic studies suggesting that uh, these kinds of peptides do diffuse into the brain. And indeed, not only can we increase the amount of trust uh, that we see in the laboratory, we can more than double the number of people who send all their money to a stranger. And so they're really showing maximal trust in a person they can't see, can't talk to, and their identity is blinded. They can't build reputation. So why would you do this? You're doing this because our brains are somehow set up to make us want to reciprocate. So we've been finding lately, when we run this MRI scanner, we also find that areas in the brain rich in oxytocin receptors, particularly the amygdala, activate strongly when you interact with a human versus a computer. So this is a contrast of uh, playing the trust game in a human versus a computer. We see activity uh, bilaterally in the amygdala, and it actually scales with the amount that you trust somebody and with 
how much someone has trusted you. So the amygdala is this primary target for oxytocin, and when we infuse oxytocin, we see a reduction in amygdala activity. So somehow the appropriate balance that we're trying to maintain between trust and distrust using the amygdala is changed when we infuse it with oxytocin. So oxytocin is higher, say, oh, well, maybe Marco doesn't look so bad. Maybe I'll let him approach, right? So this is modulating this approach withdrawal behavior. Uh, when I came here yesterday, I probably did this um, interesting ritual that humans have in which you have to touch your palm to other people's palms, call it shaking hands. Um, I hugged a couple of people. What's all that touching about? Why are we touching each other so much? So we decided to investigate this. Um, it's hard to get subjects to touch each other because you face the lawsuit problem, right? Someone gets touched inappropriately, I get sued, that's a bad thing. Um, and it's just weird. Go and hug this stranger that you don't know. And, uh, so instead we had massage therapists uh, touch people because clinicians can touch you. So I spent $6,000 on massage therapy, never got touched once. By the way, no problem recruiting for this experiment. So you come in, you get a blood draw, you get a massage, and then you do this trust task and another blood draw. What we found is that oxytocin was not released uh, by 15 minute back massage, but if you were massaged and then trusted by somebody, your brain released much more oxytocin than people who just rested and then were trusted. And uh, in addition, the return rate, that is how much money people sacrificed to the person who trusted them, was 243% higher for those in the massage group versus the rest group. Right? And that uh, difference was strongly explained by the levels of oxytocin. Right, so something important was going on there. It looks like touch may be a way we sustain reciprocity. Right? So the reason it's so important for me to shake your hand or hug you is because it helps support and give you information about my physiologic state and it bonds us together. It makes me more likely to want to trust you or at least to reciprocate if you've trusted me. Okay, some work we just uh, recently published, we also looked at um, behaviors that are not reciprocal, direct generosity. We used a task from experimental economics called the ultimatum game, which essentially is a split of a sum of money. Uh, the trick is that if the person you're offering the split to doesn't like it, he or she can reject it, and then both partners get zero. So the option here is to understand what the other person would do. When we infuse people with 40 IU of oxytocin, we find that uh, generosity, that is, offers above, above the minimum acceptance rate, so we ask people, if you're person one, how much do you offer? If you're person two, what's the smallest amount you would accept? So anything is generous if it's above minimum acceptance. So the minimum acceptance part is there because we want you to really think about the other person's uh, feelings, thoughts, how they would behave. When we do that, we find a big increase in oxytocin, uh, sorry, in generosity due to oxytocin. We don't find oxytocin effects direct altruism. Do you just want to give money to another person? They have nothing to say about it because that's not other regarding. So oxytocin really kicks in when you have to think about what the other person's going to do or feel or react. And we have found that about 2% of our, quote, normal subjects at UCLA um, have a dysregulation in oxytocin. So they are unconditional non-reciprocators. These are people who you send them money and they keep it all and they enjoy it. So that's a lot of syllables. What do we really call them in my lab? We call them bastards. <laughs> right? These are not pleasant people to be around. Okay. What we find is they have highly dysregulated oxytocin, they uh, have some traits of sociopaths, and they have, they're very self-deceptive. Um, they're quite unusual. But knowing this mechanism allows us to understand the environments in which we'd like to see, or we expect to see more pathological behavior versus more empathetic, caring, pro-social behavior. So high stress, for example, inhibits oxytocin release. So if I'm in a high stress environment, Nazi Germany, Enron, then this system's gonna be shut down. I'm in survival mode. I'm trying to get through the next two hours the next day. I'm not gonna reach out and share resources and care about other people. So I think, again, knowing the brain mechanism is important because it tells us when this is gonna kick in or not. So clearly, genes and childhood uh, experiences matter, and we're now characterizing how much those matter, how they matter, and how manipulable they are as well. Okay, so 2% ain't bad. It means most of the time with a little investigation, I can tell the atoms from the Marcos, and even if I'm wrong, 98% of the time people are gonna reciprocate anyway. Uh, we're now taking this into the clinic, and in a paper published just a couple of weeks ago, we found that those with social anxiety disorder also have highly dysregulated oxytocin levels. Uh, so I think this uh, insight we have into how we sustain appropriate social behaviors or moral behaviors among strangers 
um, not only has insights into human nature, human society, and civilization, but it has direct clinical applications as well. Okay, so what do we take home from this? Really, we have evolved brains that make us hypersocial creatures. And Thomas is a very uh, fundamentally old and important system that sustains these appropriate social behaviors. It does that by having this sort of internal monitor that gives us feedback on whether our behaviors are acceptable to the other humans. Um, this mechanism appears to work through uh, activating empathy for other people. And it makes us care about you know, those people close to us, our friends, our family, our spouses, but many times complete strangers and sometimes even different species. So I think as we understand Thomas, we understand much more about not only human beings and human nature, but the kind of creations that we've made as a society. Things like democracy. So we have an election coming up. How can we actually send these yahoos to Washington and think they're going to work for us? Now, they're, they're, we have some oversight, but basically it depends on who do you trust? Who is going to actually go there and perhaps work for your interest at least 1% of the time, if that? So I acknowledge many, many co-authors and funders and uh, many nice people who let us into their laboratories and uh, clinics to torture people. And you can read more about this on the book's website, uh, Psychology Day blogs, your local bookstore, any place you want to go. It's got to be everywhere. With that, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, so I, I'm reminded that oh, we're going to have Terry next, uh, by the way, Victoria. So. I'm reminded that uh, when Lincoln was asked what his religion was, he said, when I do bad, I feel bad. When I do good, I feel good. That's my religion. So there's an interesting connection there between sort of morality issues and how one defines one's religious position, Sam, and, uh, and, and what you're talking about there, internal 